Welcome to Games from Folk Tales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. This week, a bonus episode. These three stories are in the Victorian edition of the Pentameroni that we've been following, but I haven't cut them up for folklore because I didn't see anything which was directly applicable to Ars Magica. The problem is that two of them have heroes who are an archetype which is called the lazy boy or the holy fool, and they don't make suitable player characters because essentially they succeed, or in this case, one of them fails, because the world around them distorts itself so that people who need help get it. The other story, The Myrtle, I should have done more work with, there is a dryad in it who comes from a potted plant, and when her plant is damaged, she disappears, but when it regrows, she also regrows. This means that you could theoretically and I'm going to regret saying this, you could theoretically farm these dryads for corpus viz by growing the myrtle, which can be propagated by a division. Once again, thank you to Joy Chan for the recording and to her production team on LibriVox. As a reminder, this is not your episode for the week. It's a bonus. So I hope you'll pardon the lack of commentary from me. Chapter 2 The Myrtle There lived in the village of Miano a man and his wife who had no children whatever, and they longed with the greatest eagerness to have an heir. The woman, above all, was for ever saying, "'Oh, heavens, if I might but have a little baby, I should not care were it even a sprig of a myrtle.' And she repeated this song so often, and so wearied heaven with these words, that at last her wish was granted, and at the end of nine months, instead of a little boy or girl, she placed in the hands of the nurse a fine sprig of myrtle. This she planted with great delight in a pot, ornamented with ever so many beautiful figures, and set it in the window, tending it morning and evening, with more diligence than the gardener does a bed of cabbages from which he reckons to pay the rent of his garden. Now the king's son, happening to pass by, as he was going to hunt, took a prodigious fancy to this beautiful plant, and sent to ask the mistress of the house if she would sell it, for he would give even one of his eyes for it. The woman at last, after a thousand difficulties and refusals, allured by his offers, dazzled by his promises, frightened by his threats, overcome by his prayers, gave him the pot, beseeching him to hold it dear, for she loved it more than a daughter, and valued it as much as if it were her own offspring." Then the prince had the flower-pot carried with the greatest care in the world into his own chamber, and placed it in a balcony, and tended and watered it with his own hand. It happened one evening, when the prince had gone to bed, and put out the candles, and all were at rest and in their first sleep, that he heard the sound of someone stealing through the house, and coming cautiously towards his bed, whereat he thought it must be some chamber-boy coming to lighten his purse for him, or some mischievous imp to pull the bedclothes off him. But as he was a bold fellow whom none could frighten, he acted the dead cat, waiting to see the upshot of the affair. When he perceived the object approach nearer, and stretching out his hand felt something smooth, and instead of laying hold, as he expected, on the prickles of a hedgehog, he touched a little creature more soft and fine than barbary wool, more pliant and tender than a marten's tail, more delicate than thistledown. He flew from one thought to another, and taking her to be a fairy, as indeed she was, he conceived at once a great affection for her. The next morning, before the sun, like a chief physician, went out to visit the flowers that are sick and languid, the unknown fair one rose and disappeared, leaving the prince filled with curiosity and wonder. But when this had gone on for seven days, he was burning and melting with desire to know what good fortune this was that the stars had showered down on him, and what ship freighted with the graces of love it was that had come to its moorings in his chamber. So one night, when the fair maiden was fast asleep, he tied one of her tresses to his arm, that she might not escape. Then he called a chamberlain, and bidding him light the candles, he saw the flower of beauty the miracle of women, the looking-glass and painted egg of Venus, 
the fair bait of love. He saw a little doll, a beautiful dove, a Fata Morgana, a banner. He saw a golden trinket, a hunter, a falcon's eye, a moon in her fifteenth day, a pigeon's bill, a morsel for a king, a jewel. He saw, in short, a sight to amaze one. In astonishment he cried, O oh, sleep, sweet sleep, heap poppies on the eyes of this lovely jewel. Interrupt not my delight in viewing as long as I desire this triumph of beauty. O oh, lovely tress that binds me, O oh, lovely eyes that inflame me, O oh, lovely lips that refresh me, O oh, lovely bosom that consoles me. O oh, where at what shop of the wonders of nature was this living statue made? What India gave the gold for these hairs? What Ethiopia the ivory to form these brows? What seashore the carbuncles that compose these eyes? What tire the purple to dye this face? What east the pearls to string these teeth? And from what mountains was the snow taken to sprinkle over this bosom? Snow contrary to nature that nurtures the flowers and burns hearts. So saying, he made a vine of his arms, and clasping her neck, she awoke from her sleep and replied with a gentle smile to the sigh of the enamoured prince, who, seeing her open her eyes, said, O oh, my treasure, if viewing without candles this temple of love I was in transports, what will become of my life now that you have lighted two lamps? O oh, beauteous eyes, that with a trump-card of light make the stars bankrupt, you alone have pierced this heart. You alone can make a poultice for it like fresh eggs. O oh, my lovely physician, take pity, take pity on one who is sick of love, who having changed the air from the darkness of night to the light of this beauty, is seized by a fever. Lay your hand on this heart, feel my pulse, give me a prescription. But, my soul, why do I ask for a prescription? I desire no other comfort than a touch of that little hand for I am certain that with the cordial of that fair grace, and with the healing root of that tongue of thine, I shall be sound and well again. At these words the lovely fairy grew as red as fire, and replied, Not so much praise, my lord prince. I am your servant, and would do anything in the world to serve that kingly face, and I esteem it great good fortune that from a bunch of myrtle set in a pot of earth, I have become a branch of laurel, hung over the inn door of a heart in which there is so much greatness and virtue. The prince, melting at these words like a tallow candle, began again to embrace her, and sealing the latter with a kiss, he gave her his hand, saying, Take my faith, you shall be my wife, you shall be mistress of my scepter, you shall have the key of this heart, as you hold the helm of this life. After these and a hundred other ceremonies and discourses, they arose, and so it went on for several days. But as spoil sport marriage parting fate is always a hindrance to the steps of love, it fell out that the prince was summoned to hunt a great wild boar which was ravaging the country. So he was forced to leave his wife, but as he loved her more than his life, and saw that she was beautiful beyond all beautiful things, from this love and beauty there sprang up the feeling of jealousy, which is a tempest in the sea of love, a piece of soot that falls into the pottage of the bliss of lovers, which is a serpent that bites, a worm that gnaws, a gall that poisons, a frost that kills, making life always restless, the mind unstable, the heart ever suspicious. So, calling the fairy, he said to her, I am obliged, my heart, to be away from home for two or three days. Heaven knows with how much grief I tear myself from you, who are my soul, and heaven knows too whether, ere I set out, my life may not end. But as I cannot help going to please my father, I must leave you. I therefore pray you, by all the love you bear me, to go back into the flower-pot, and not to come out of it till I return, which will be as soon as possible." I will do so, said the fairy, for I cannot and will not refuse what pleases you. Go, therefore, and may the mother of good luck go with you, for I will serve you to the best of my power. But do me one favour. 
leave a thread of silk with a bell tied to the top of the myrtle, and when you come back, pull the thread and ring, and immediately I will come out and say, Here I am. The prince did so, and then calling a chamberlain said to him, Come hither, come hither you, open your ears and mind what I say. Make this bed every evening, as if I were myself to sleep in it. Water this flower-pot regularly, and mind, I have counted the leaves, and if I find one missing, I will take from you the means of earning your bread. So saying, he mounted his horse, and went like a sheep that has led to the slaughter, to follow a boar. In the meanwhile, seven wicked women, with whom the prince had been acquainted, began to grow jealous, and being curious to pry into the secret, they sent for a mason, and for a good sum of money, got him to make an underground passage from their house into the prince's chamber. Then these cunning jades went through the passage in order to explore. But finding nothing, they opened the window, and when they saw the beautiful myrtle standing there, each of them plucked a leaf from it. But the youngest took off the entire top, to which the little bell was hung, and the moment it was touched, the bell tinkled, and the fairy, thinking it was the prince, immediately came out. As soon as the wicked women saw this lovely creature, they fastened their talons on her, crying, "'You are she who turns to your own mill the stream of our hopes. "'You it is who have stolen the favour of the prince. "'But you are come to an end of your tricks, my fine lady. "'You are nimble enough in running off, "'but you are caught in your tricks this time, "'and if you escape, you were never born.' "'So saying, they flew upon her, "'and instantly tore her in pieces, "'and each of them took her part. "'But the youngest would not join in this cruel act, and when she was invited by her sisters to do as they did, she would take nothing but a lock of those golden hairs. So when they had done, they went quickly away by the passage through which they had come. Meanwhile the chamberlain came to make the bed and water the flower-pot, according to his master's orders, and seeing this pretty piece of work, he had liked to have died of terror. Then biting his nails with vexation, he set to work, gathered up the remains of the flesh and bones that were left, and scraping the blood from the floor, he piled them all up in a heap in the pot, and having watered it, he made the bed, locked the door, put the key under the door, and taking to his heels, ran away out of the town. When the prince came back from the chase, he pulled the silken string and rung the little bell. But ring as he would, it was all lost time. He might sound the tocsin, and ring till he was tired, for the fairy gave no heed. So he went straight to the chamber, and not having patience to call the chamberlain and ask for the key, he gave the lock a kick, burst open the door, went in, opened the window, and seeing the myrtle stripped of its leaves, he fell to making a most doleful lamentation, crying, shouting, and bawling. O oh, wretched me! Unhappy me! O oh, miserable me! Who has played me this trick, and who has thus trumped my card? O oh, ruined, banished, and undone prince! O oh, my leafless myrtle, my lost fairy! O oh, my wretched life! My joys vanished into smoke, my pleasures turned to vinegar! What will you do, unhappy man? Leap quickly over this ditch! You have fallen from all happiness, and will you not cut your throat? You are robbed of every treasure. You are expelled from life, and do you not go mad? Where are you? Where are you, my myrtle? And what soul more hard than marble has destroyed this beautiful flower-pot? O oh, cursed chase that has chased me from all happiness! Alas, I am done for! I am overthrown! I am ruined! I have ended my days! It is not possible for me to get through life without my life! I must stretch my legs, since without my love sleep will be lamentation, food poison, pleasure insipid, and life sour. These and many other exclamations that would move the very stones in the streets were uttered by the prince, and after repeating them again and again, and wailing bitterly, full of sorrow and woe, never shutting an eye to sleep, nor opening his mouth to eat, he gave such way to grief that his face, 
which was before of oriental vermilion, became of gold paint, and the ham of his lips became rusty bacon. The fairy, who had sproused up again from the remains that were put in the pot, seeing the misery and tribulation of her poor lover, and how he was turned in a second to the colour of a sick Spaniard, of a venomous lizard, of the sap of a leaf, of a jaundiced person, of a dried pear, was moved with compassion, and springing out of the pot, like the light of a candle shooting out of a dark lantern, she stood before Cola Marchione, and embracing him in her arms, she said, "'Take heart, take heart, my prince, have done now with this lamenting, wipe your eyes, quiet your anger, smooth your face.' Behold me alive and handsome, in spite of those wicked women who split my head and so ill-treated me. The prince, seeing this when he least expected it, arose again from death to life, and the colour returned to his cheeks, warmth to his blood, breath to his breast. After giving her a thousand caresses and embraces, he desired to know the whole affair from head to foot, and when he found that the chamberlain was not to blame, he ordered him to be called, and giving a great banquet, he, with the full consent of his father, married the fairy. And he invited all the great people of the kingdom, but, above all others, he would have present those seven serpents who had committed the slaughter of that sweet suckling calf. And as soon as they had done eating, the prince asked all the guests, one after another, what he deserved who had injured that beautiful maiden pointing to the fairy, who looked so lovely that she shot hearts like a sprite and drew souls like a windlass. Then all who sat at table, beginning with the king, said, one that he deserved the gallows, another that he merited the wheel, a third the pincers, a fourth to be thrown from a precipice. In short, one proposed this punishment and another that. At last it came to the turn of the seven wicked women to speak, who, although they did not much relish this conversation, yet, as the truth comes out when the wine goes about, answered that whoever had the heart basely to touch only this quintessence of the charms of love deserved to be buried alive in a dungeon. "'As you have pronounced this sentence with your own lips,' said the prince, "'you have yourselves judged the cause. You have yourselves signed the decree.' It remains for me to cause your order to be executed, since it is you who with the heart of a negro, with the cruelty of Medea, made a fritter of this beautiful head, and chopped up these lovely limbs like sausage meat. So quick, make haste, lose not a moment. Throw them this very instant into a large dungeon, where they shall end their days miserably. So this order was instantly carried into execution. The prince married the younger sister of these wicked creatures to the chamberlain, and gave her a good portion. And giving also to the father and mother of the myrtle wherewithal to live comfortably, he himself spent his days happily with the fairy, while the wicked women ended their lives in bitter anguish, and thus verified the proverb of the wise men of old, The lame goat will hop if he meets with no stop. CHAPTER three, PERUONTO a good deed is never lost. He who sows courtesy reaps benefit, and he who gathers kindness gathers love. Pleasure bestowed on a grateful mind was never barren, but always brings a good recompense, and that is the moral of the story I am going to tell you. Once upon a time a woman who lived in a village, and was called Cecarella, had a son named Peruonto, who was one of the most stupid lads that ever was born. This made his mother very unhappy, and all day long she would grieve because of this great misfortune, for whether she asked him kindly or stormed at him till her throat was dry, the foolish fellow would not stir to do the slightest hand's turn for her. At last, after a thousand dinnings at his brain, and a thousand splittings of his head, and saying, I tell you, and I told you, day after day, she got him to go to the wood for a faggot, saying, "'Come now, it is time for us to get a morsel to eat. "'So run off for some sticks and don't forget yourself on the way, "'but come back as quick as you can, "'and we will boil ourselves some cabbage to keep the life in us.' 
away went the stupid Peronto, hanging down his head as if he were going to jail. Away he went, walking as if he were a jackdaw, or treading on eggs, counting his steps, at the pace of a snail's gallop, and making all sorts of zigzags and excursions on his way to the wood, to come there after the fashion of a raven. And when he reached the middle of a plain, through which ran a river growling and murmuring at the bad manners of the stones that were stopping its way, he saw three youths who had made themselves a bed of grass and a pillow of a great flint stone, and were lying sound asleep under the blaze of the sun, who was shooting his rays down on them point blank. When Peruanto saw these poor creatures, looking as if they were in the midst of a fountain of fire, he felt pity for them, and cutting some branches of oak, he made a handsome arbour over them. Meanwhile the youths, who were the sons of a fairy, awoke, and seeing the kindness and courtesy of Peronto, they gave him a charm that everything he asked for should be done. Peronto, having performed this good action, went his ways towards the wood, where he made up such an enormous faggot that it would have needed an engine to draw it, and, seeing that he could not in any way get it on his back, he set himself astride of it and cried, "'Oh, what a lucky fellow I should be if this faggot would carry me riding a horseback!' and the word was hardly out of his mouth when the faggot began to trot and gallop like a great horse, and when it came in front of the king's palace, it pranced and capered and curvetted in a way that would amaze you. The ladies who were standing at one of the windows, on seeing such a wonderful sight, ran to call Vastola, the daughter of the king, who, going to the window and observing the caracols of a faggot and the bounds of a bundle of wood, burst out a-laughing, a thing which, owing to her natural melancholy, she never remembered to have done before. Peronto raised his head, and seeing that it was at him that they were laughing, exclaimed, "'Oh, Vastola, I wish that I could be your husband, and I would soon cure you of laughing at me.' And so saying, he struck his heels into the faggot, and in a dashing gallop he was quickly at home, with such a train of little boys at his heels, that if his mother had not been quick to shut the door, they would soon have killed him with the stones and sticks with which they pelted him. Now came the question of marrying Vastola to some great prince, and her father invited all he knew to come and visit him and pay their respects to the princess. But she refused to have anything to say to either of them, and only answered, I will marry none but the young man who rode on the faggot. So that the king got more and more angry with every refusal, and at last he was quite unable to contain himself any longer, and called his council together and said, You know by this time how my honour has been shamed, and that my daughter has acted in such a manner that all the chronicles will tell the story against me. So now speak and advise me. I say that she is unworthy to live, seeing that she has brought me into such discredit, and I wish to put her altogether out of the world before she does more mischief. The counsellors who had in their time learned much wisdom said, Of a truth she deserves to be severely punished, but, after all, it is this audacious scoundrel who has give you the annoyance, and it is not right that he should escape through the meshes of the net. Let us wait then till he comes to light, and we discover the root of this disgrace, and then we will think it over and resolve what were best to be done. This counsel pleased the king, for he saw that they spoke like sensible, prudent men. So he held his hand and said, Let us wait and see the end of this business. So then the king made a great banquet, and invited every one of his nobles and all the gentlemen in his kingdom to come to it, and set Vastola at the high table at the top of the hall. For, he said, no common man can have done this, and when she recognises the fellow, we shall see her eyes turn to him, and we will instantly lay hold on him and put him out of the way. But when the feasting was done, and all the guests passed out in a line, Vastola took no more notice of them than Alexander's bulldog did of the rabbits, and the king grew more angry than ever, and vowed that he would kill her without more delay. Again, however, the counsellors pacified him, and said, "'Softly, softly, your majesty. Quiet your wrath. Let us make another banquet to-morrow, not for people of condition, but for the lower sort. 
Some women always attach themselves to the worst, and we shall find among the cutlers and bead-makers and comb-sellers the root of your anger, which we have not discovered among the cavaliers. This reasoning took the fancy of the king, and he ordered a second banquet to be prepared, to which, on proclamation being made, came all the riff-raff and rag-tag and bobtail of the city, such as rogues, scavengers, tinkers, peddlers, sweeps, beggars, and such like rabble, who were all in high glee, and, taking their seats like noblemen at a great long table, they began to feast and gobble away. Now, when Cecarella heard this proclamation, she began to urge Peruanto to go there too, until at last she got him to set out for the feast. And scarcely had he arrived there when Vastolo cried out without thinking, "'That is my knight of the faggot!' When the king heard this, he tore his beard, seeing that the bean of the cake, the prize in the lottery, had fallen to an ugly lout, the very sight of whom he could not endure, with a shaggy head, owl's eyes, a parrot's nose, a deer's mouth, and legs bare and bandy. Then, heaving a deep sigh, he said, "'What can that jade of a daughter of mine have seen to make her take a fancy to this ogre, or strike up a dance with this hairy foot? O oh, vile, false creature! Who has cast so base a spell on her?' But why do we wait? Let her suffer the punishment she deserves. Let her undergo the penalty that shall be decreed by you, and take her from my presence, for I cannot bear to look longer upon her. Then the counsellors consulted together, and they resolved that she, as well as the evildoer, should be shut up in a cask and thrown into the sea, so that without staining the king's hands with the blood of one of his family, they should carry out the sentence. No sooner was the judgment pronounced than the cask was brought and both were put into it. But before they coopered it up, some of Vastola's ladies, crying and sobbing as if their hearts would break, put into it a basket of raisins and dried figs that she might have wherewithal to live on for a little while. And when the cask was closed up, it was flung into the sea, on which it went floating as the wind drove it. Meanwhile Vastola, weeping till her eyes ran like two rivers, said to Peronto, "'What a sad misfortune is this of ours! Oh, if I but knew who has played me this trick, to have caged me in this dungeon! Alas, alas, to find myself in this plight without knowing how! Tell me, tell me, O oh cruel man, what incantation was it you made, and what spell did you employ to bring me within the circle of this cask?' Peruanto, who had been for some time paying little attention to her, at last said, "'If you want me to tell you, you must give me some figs and raisins.' So Vastola, to draw the secret out of him, gave him a handful of both, and as soon as he had eaten them he told her truly all that had befallen him, with the three youths and with the faggot, and with herself at the window, which, when the poor lady heard, she took heart and said to Peruanto, "'My friend, shall we then let our lives run out in a cask? "'Why don't you cause this tub to be changed into a fine ship "'and run into some good harbour to escape this danger?' "'And Peruanto replied, "'If you would have me say the spell, "'with figs and raisins feed me well.' "'So Vastola, to make him open his mouth, "'filled it with fruit, "'and so she fished the words out of him. "'And lo, as soon as Peruanto had said what she desired,' The cask was turned into a beautiful ship, with sails and sailors and everything that could be wished for, and guns and trumpets, and a splendid cabin in which Vastola sat filled with delight. It being now the hour when the moon begins to play at seesaw with the sun, Vastola said to Peronto, "'My fine lad, now make this ship to be changed into a palace, for then we shall be more secure. You know the saying, "'Praise the sea, but keep to the land.' And Peruanto replied, "'If you would have me say the spell, "'with figs and raisins feed me well.' So Vastola at once fed him again, and Peruanto, swallowing down the raisins and figs, did her pleasure. And immediately the ship came to land, and was changed into a beautiful palace, fitted up in a most sumptuous manner, and so full of furniture and curtains and hangings that there was nothing more to ask for so that Vastola, who a little before would not have set the price of a farthing on her life, did not now wish to change places with the greatest lady in the world, 
seeing herself served and treated like a queen. Then to put the seal on all her good fortune, she besought Peruonto to obtain grace to become handsome and polished in his manner, that they might live happy together. For though the proverb says, better to have a pig for a husband than a smile from an emperor, still, if his appearance were changed, she should think herself the happiest woman in the universe. And Peruonto replied as before, If you would have me say the spell, with figs and raisins feed me well. Then Vastola quickly opened his lips, and scarcely had he spoken the words when he was changed, as it were, from an owl to a nightingale, from an ogre to a beautiful youth, from a scarecrow to a fine gentleman. Vastola, seeing such a transformation, clasped him in her arms, and was almost beside herself with joy. Then they were married and lived happily for years. Meanwhile the king grew old and very sad, so that one day, the courtiers persuaded him to go a-hunting to cheer him up. Night overtook him, and seeing a light in the palace, he sent a servant to know if he could be entertained there, and he was answered that everything was at his disposal. So the king went to the palace, and passing into a great guest-chamber, he saw no living soul but two little boys who skipped around him, crying, "'Welcome! Welcome!' The king, surprised and astonished, stood like one that was enchanted, and sitting down to rest himself at a table. To his amazement he saw invisibly spread on it a Flanders tablecloth, with dishes full of roast meats and all sorts of viands, so that, in truth, he feasted like a king, waited on by those beautiful children. And all the while he sat at table, a concert of lutes and tambourines never ceased, such delicious music that it went to the tips of its fingers and toes. When he had done eating, a bed suddenly appeared, all made of gold, and having his boots taken off, he went to rest, and all his courtiers did the same, after having fed heartily at a hundred tables, which were laid out in the other rooms. When morning came, the king wished to thank the two little children, but with them appeared Vastola and her husband, and casting herself at his feet, she asked his pardon and related the whole story. The king, seeing that he had found two grandsons, who were two jewels, and a son-in-law who was a fairy, embraced first one and then the other, and taking up the children in his arms, they all returned to the city, where there was a great festival that lasted many days. CHAPTER Four, Variello If nature had given to animals the necessity of clothing themselves and of buying their food, the race of quadrupeds would inevitably be destroyed. Therefore it is that they find their food without trouble, without gardener to gather it, purchaser to buy it, cook to prepare it, or carver to cut it up, whilst their skin defends them from the rain and snow, without the merchant giving them cloth, the tailor making the dress, or the errand-boy begging for a drink-penny. To man, however, who has intelligence, nature did not care to grant these indulgences, since he is able to procure for himself what he wants. This is the reason that we commonly see clever men poor and blockheads rich, as you may gather from the story which I am going to tell you. Granoni of Aprano was a woman of a great sense and judgment, but she had a son named Vadiello, who was the greatest booby and simpleton in the whole country round about. Nevertheless, as a mother's eyes are bewitched and see what does not exist, she doted upon him so much that she was forever caressing and fondling him, as if he were the handsomest creature in the world. Now Granonia kept a brood-hen that was sitting upon a nest of eggs, in which she had placed all her hope, expecting to have a fine brood of chickens, and to make a good profit of them. And having one day to go out on some business, she called her son and said to him, my pretty son of your own mother, listen to what I say. Keep your eye upon the hen, and if she should get up to scratch and pick, look sharp and drive her back to the nest, for otherwise the eggs will grow cold, and then we shall have neither eggs nor chickens. Leave it to me, replied Vardiello. You are not speaking to deaf ears. One thing more, said the mother. Look ye, my blessed son, in yon cupboard is a pot full of a certain poisonous things. Take care that ugly sin does not tempt you to touch them, for they would make you stretch your legs in a trice. 
"'Heaven forbid!' replied Vardiello. "'Poison, indeed, will not tempt me. "'But you have done wisely to give me the warning, "'for if I had got at it, "'I should certainly have eaten it all up.' "'Thereupon the mother went out, "'but Vardiello stayed behind, "'and, in order to lose no time, "'he went into the garden to dig holes, "'which he covered with bows and earth, "'to catch the little thieves who come to steal the fruit. "'And as he was in the midst of his work, "'he saw the hen come running out of the room, "'whereupon he began to cry, "'Hish, hish, this way, that way!' "'But the hen did not stir a foot, "'and Vardiello, seeing that she had something of a donkey in her, "'after crying, hish, hish, "'began to stamp with his feet, "'and after stamping with his feet, "'to throw his cap at her, "'and after the cap a cudgel which hit her just upon the pate "'and made her quickly stretch her legs.' When Vardiello saw this sad accident, he bethought himself how to remedy the evil, and making a virtue of necessity, in order to prevent the eggs growing cold, he set himself down upon the nest. But in doing so, he gave the eggs an unlucky blow, and quickly made an omelette of them. In despair at what he had done, he was on the point of knocking his head against the wall. At last, however, as all grief turns to hunger, Feeling his stomach begin to grumble, he resolved to eat up the hen. So he plucked her, and sticking her upon a spit, he made a great fire, and set to work to roast her. And when she was cooked, Vardiello, to do everything in due order, spread a clean cloth upon an old chest, and then, taking a flagon, he went down into the cellar to draw some wine. But just as he was in the midst of drawing the wine, he heard a noise, a disturbance, an uproar in the house, which seemed like the clattering of horses' hoofs. Whereat, starting up in alarm and turning his eyes, he saw a big tomcat, which had run off with the hen, spit and all, and another cat chasing after him, mewing and crying out for a part. Vardiello, in order to set this mishap to rights, darted upon the cat like an unchained lion, and in his haste he left the tap of the barrel running and after chasing the cat through every hole and corner of the house, he recovered the hen. But the cask had meanwhile all run out, and when Vardiello returned and saw the wine running about, he let the cask of his soul empty itself through the tap-holes of his eyes. But at last judgment came to his aid, and he hit upon a plan to remedy the mischief, and prevent his mother's finding out what had happened. So, taking a sack of flour, filled full to the mouth, he sprinkled it over the wine on the floor. But when he meanwhile reckoned up on his fingers all the disasters he had met with, and thought to himself that, from the number of fooleries he had committed, he must have lost the game in the good graces of Grenonia, he resolved in his heart not to let his mother see him again alive. So thrusting his hand into the jar of pickled walnuts, which his mother had said contained poison, he never stopped eating until he came to the bottom. And when he had right well filled his stomach, he went and hid himself in the oven. In the meanwhile his mother returned, and stood knocking for a long time at the door. But at last, seeing that no one came, she gave it a kick, and going in, she called her son at the top of her voice. But as nobody answered, she imagined that some mischief must have happened, and with increased lamentation, she went on crying louder and louder. Vardiello, Vardiello, are you deaf that you don't hear? Have you the cramp that you don't run? Have you the pit that you don't answer? Where are you, you rogue? Where are you hidden, you naughty fellow? Vardiello, on hearing all this hubbub and abuse, cried out at last with a piteous voice, Here I am, here I am in the oven, but you will never see me again, mother. Why so? said the poor mother. Because I am poisoned, replied the son. "'Alas, alas!' cried Grenonia. "'How come you to do that? "'What cause have you had to commit this homicide? "'And who has given you poison?' "'Then Vardiello told her, one after another, "'all the pretty things he had done, "'on which account he wished to die "'and not to remain any longer a laughing-stock in the world. "'The poor woman, on hearing all this, "'was miserable and wretched,' and she had enough to do and to say to drive this melancholy whimsy out of Vardiello's head. And being infatuated and dotingly fond of him, 
she gave him some sweetmeats, and so put the affair of the pickled walnuts out of his head, and convinced him that they were not poison, but good and comforting to the stomach. And having thus pacified him with cheering words, and showered on him a thousand caresses, she drew him out of the oven. Then giving him a fine piece of cloth, she bade him go and sell it, but cautioning him not to do business with folks of too many words. Tut, tut, said Fardiello, let me alone, I know what I'm about, never fear. So saying, he took the cloth and went his way through the city of Naples, crying, Cloth, cloth! But whenever any one asked him, What cloth have you there? He replied, You are no customer for me, you are a man of too many words. And when another said to him, "'How do you sell your cloth?' "'He called him a chatterbox, who deafened him with his noise. "'At length he chanced to espy in the courtyard of a house "'which was deserted on account of the Monticello, "'a plaster statue, and being tired out and wearied with going about and about, "'he sat himself down on a bench. "'But not seeing any one astir in the house, which looked like a sacked village, "'he was lost in amazement and said to the statue, "'Tell me, comrade, does no one live in this house?' Vardiello waited a while, but as the statue gave no answer, he thought this surely was a man of few words. So he said, "'Friend, will you buy my cloth? I'll sell it you cheap.' And seeing that the statue still remained dumb, he exclaimed, "'Faith, then, I found my man at last. There, take the cloth, examine it, and give me what you will. Tomorrow I'll return for the money.' So saying, Vardiello left the cloth on the spot where he had been sitting, and the first mother's son who passed that way found the prize and carried it off. When Vardiello returned home without the cloth, and told his mother all that had happened, she well nigh swooned away and said to him, "'When will you put that headpiece of yours in order? See now what tricks you have played me. Only think! But I am myself to blame for being too tender-hearted, instead of having given you a good beating at first. And now I perceive that a pitiful doctor only makes the wound incurable. But you'll go on with your pranks, until at last we come to a serious falling out, and then there will be a long reckoning, my lad. Softly, mother, replied Vardiello, matters are not so bad as they seem. Do you want more than crown pieces, brand new from the mint? Do you think me a fool and that I don't know what I am about? Tomorrow is not yet here. Wait a while, and you shall see whether I know how to fit a handle to a shovel. The next morning, as soon as the shades of night, pursued by the constables of the sun, had fled the country, Vardiello repaired to the courtyard where the statue stood and said, Good day, friend. Can you give me those few pence you owe me? Come, quick, pay me for the cloth. But when he saw that the statue remained speechless, he took up a stone and hurled it at its breast with such force that it burst a vein, which proved indeed the cure to his own malady. For some pieces of the statue falling off, he discovered a pot full of golden crown pieces. Then taking it in both his hands, off he ran home, head over heels, as far as he could scamper, crying out, Mother, mother, see here! What a load of red lupins I've got! How many, how many! His mother, seeing the crown pieces, and knowing very well that Vardiello would soon make the matter public, told him to stand at the door until the man with milk and new-made cheese came past, as she wanted to buy a pennyworth of milk. So Vardiello, who was a great glutton, went quickly and seated himself at the door, and his mother showered down from the window above raisins and dried figs for more than half an hour. Whereupon Vardiello, picking them up as fast as he could, cried aloud, "'Mother, mother, bring out some baskets! Give me some bowls! Here, quick with the tubs and buckets! For if it goes on to rain thus, we shall be rich in a trice!' And when he had eaten his fill, Vardiello went out to sleep. It happened one day that two countrymen, the food and lifeblood of the law courts, fell out, and went to law about a gold crown piece which they had found on the ground. And Vardiello passing by said, "'What jackasses you are to quarrel about a red lupin like this! "'For my part I don't value it at a pin's head, "'for I've found a whole pot full of them.' "'When the judge heard this, he opened wide his eyes and ears, "'and examined Vardiello closely, asking him how, when, and where he had found the crowns. 
and Vardiello replied, "'I found them in a palace inside a dumb man "'when it rained raisins and dried figs.' "'At this the judge stared with amazement, "'but instantly seeing how the matter stood. "'He decreed that Vardiello should be sent to a madhouse "'as the most competent tribunal for him. "'Thus the stupidity of the son made the mother rich, "'and the mother's wit found a remedy for the foolishness of the son.' whereby it is clearly seen that a ship, when steered by a skilful hand, will seldom strike upon rock or sand. Your saga may vary.